Nicholas Bornois of Capital Inc. I would like to welcome you to Capital Inc.'s trending news pod podcast series. We have the opportunity today to have with us Carlos Balestra de Motola. He is the Chief Financial Officer of D'Amico International Shipping, a major product anchor company listed on the Milan Stock Exchange. And um, D'Amico International Shipping released their earnings, uh, their Q1 earnings uh, in a, a few days uh, before, so our podcast is particularly timely to talk about the product tanker market and uh, D'Amico. Uh, Carlos, welcome. Let me uh, start our discussion by asking you, the product tanker market uh, is hot right now. It has shown strong performance. So what drives the market? Is it drivers related to sector fundamentals? Uh, are drivers related to the Ukrainian crisis or both? Uh, hi, Nicholas, and uh, thank you. Yes, uh, it, it is both. Um, it, uh, undoubtedly, the, the war in Ukraine is having a big impact in the market. Uh, there's uh, an ongoing reshuffling of trades, uh, an increase in the average distances uh, which uh, um, vessels are sailing. Um, imports into Europe uh, are coming from uh, further away, um, um, from Asia and from the Middle East. Um, and uh, this is supporting the market currently, but this is a recovery which is still lacking volume. I mean, and the, and the weakness in the VLCC market is a testament to that. And so as volumes increase during the year, as a, there's going to be a ramp up in production from, uh, from OPEC, uh, there's going to be more uh, oil coming out from the US, uh, from Canada, from Guyana, and from Brazil, uh, an expected increase of 5.5 million barrels per day this year. That should be more than enough to compensate for rush, lost Russian exports uh, and for the increase in demand, which despite the, the high oil price environment is still expected to be healthy this year. Perfect. Now, in your presentation, um, you had a slide that was distinguishing between short-term and longer-term demand drivers uh, which I found very interesting. So can you elaborate on uh, exactly the, the details of short-term versus long-term demand drivers? Yeah, Nicholas, I mean, so, some of these uh, uh, points we already touched upon, but uh, uh, one key uh, uh, demand driver uh, going forward uh, uh, short-term is, is, is the increase in jet fuel demand. Um, we, we expect to see a very strong uh, uh, driving and traveling season uh, this summer. Um, uh, we are seeing that the companies such as Booking.com and Airbnb are providing very strong guidance as to the bookings they are receiving for the for the upcoming holiday season, and uh, and that should def definitely ben benefit our market. We are also seeing refining margins which are at record highs, and this should be driving uh, stronger refining throughputs uh, this year. Uh, with a very healthy increase in, uh, in refined volumes of uh, over 3 million barrels in, uh, in 2022, uh, with a volume, refined volumes ending the year at levels similar, around the same levels as in 2019. Of course, then we have also a very uh, low order book, um, which is going to be supporting the market going forward. And then longer term, uh, we also have the often mentioned change in the refining landscape, which was accelerated uh, because of COVID with a lot of the older refiners in the US, in Europe, uh, Australia, New Zealand uh, being closed and uh, um, the large majority of the refinery additions occurring in the Middle East and Asia. You already took me to the next question that I wanted to ask you about the order book uh, and environmental, environmental regulations and scrapping. So can you elaborate in a bit more detail on the order book, on scrapping, and uh, on the impact of uh, the new environmental regulations? Yes, this is a, a very important factor, which is going to be supporting the market for, for many years. Uh, the order book in the segments we operate in, so handy size MR, LR1, is at 3.5% uh, of the vessels on the water. So that is a historical low. Um, this year, around three vessels have been ordered, so really uh, almost nothing. Um, the, the fleet is aging fast. 30% uh, of the fleet in the segments we operate in is uh, more than 15 years, has more than 15 years of age, and 6% is more than 20 years old. So 
there's uh, a lot of potential for demolition. Vessels which are older than 15 years of age uh, are also uh, limited commercially um, on, on, on how they can be employed and they, and they are not the preferred choice and often not eligible for long-term charter business with the oil major. So the, with the new regulations coming into force, these vessels, these older vessels are going to be even more penalized. And they, of course, also suffering a lot because of the high banker prices and, uh, and the higher uh, fuel oil consumption. So given the very high steel prices we are seeing now, right now, uh, there is a very big incentive for, uh, for older vessels to be demolished. Of course, if markets are very strong, demolition might, might not be uh, particularly high and uh, they might be postponed. But uh, if demolitions in the segments we, are, we operate in were to remain at the levels uh, seen in the last half of last year, we could actually already be seeing negative fleet growth in the second half of this year. So if I can bring into the puzzle, into the equilibrium, the, the sanctions, uh, how do you think they can impact um, uh, fleet supply uh, demand, especially, I mean, you mentioned in that during your earnings call that you voluntarily uh, abstain from uh, Russian cargoes. So how does this crisis affect uh, product tackle shipping? Well, the, the sanctions are, are having a, a big impact uh, in the market, as I mentioned, because uh, they have led to this uh, increase in the average distances sales. We as a company, uh, decided not to call uh, Russian ports. Um, it is possible that uh, uh, these sanctions might lead uh, some uh, some older vessels which have been uh, employed in uh, in trades out of Venezuela and Iran uh, to also be employed uh, in trades out of Russia, um, and, and therefore that might slow down the demolition of older vessels. We are seeing that. Uh, uh, VLCC demolition has been lagging behind, uh, and this is one of the reasons, because a lot of these vessels have been um, employed in, uh, in trades, uh, uh, in sanctioned trades. Very interesting. So let's talk a, a little bit about the micro international shipping on Q1. It's already behind us, uh, but uh, your performance has been improved. But is, are there any particular highlights you would like to mention? in terms of major developments during the quarter? No, Q1 was still a, a transition quarter for us, uh, excluding non-recurring items. Our loss was of uh, 4.2 million, but more importantly, in March already, we were substantially at break even. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the loss is really the result of a very weak February, which was negatively affected by the surge in Omicron cases. and. Uh, resulting restrictions to the movement of people um, in Europe and in the US. So looking ahead now, uh, what are the cornerstones of uh, your strategy in terms of fleet expansion? I know that you have a number of purchase options on vessels, uh, strategy in terms of chartering and capital allocation. So if you can mention, uh, you know, if, we, if we can focus on each point. Yes, Nicholas. Uh, we currently have only uh, plans uh, investments associated with the maintenance of, of our vessels. Uh, as you know, new building prices have risen significantly over the last year, um, and we are therefore unlikely to order new product tankers uh, soon, unless uh, if linked to a very long-term contract at a very attractive rate, and also, of course, with a very sound counterparty. Uh, so our plan is uh, first to deleverage um, and bring our net financial position to fleet market value ratio uh, based on mid-cycle values uh, to below 50%. Um, we ended the uh, first quarter this year at 58.5%. Uh, and we plan to do to deleverage also to the exercise of the purchase options on the, on the vessels we, we are currently leasing. Uh, allowing us also to uh, reduce our overall cost of funding. Um, but we do continue monitoring the market for attractive uh, investment opportunities. And uh, if these were to materialize, we are definitely going to be seizing them. 
Thank you. Now let's conclude with uh, a question on ESG and especially on your initiatives related to safety issues and the environment. I know that you have a big commitment in those areas. Safety has always been and will continue being a top priority for us uh, and for our clients. Um, it is also thanks to our focus on this topic that we have access to long-term contracts uh, with the most demanding oil majors. Uh, although I would like to highlight in this respect that we are very glad that our fleet coverage falls over the coming quarters. Um, we only have 25% coverage in the second half of 22 and only 6% in 2023. Uh, and we will therefore be able to fully benefit from the strong markets we anticipate in the coming quarters. Uh, regarding the environment, uh, we are working on several fronts to increase the efficiency of our vessels. Um, we, we plan to install propeller um, boss cap fins on the few vessels we have, which are uh, pre-phase two of EEDI. Um, we are looking to install uh, fuel injection valves on our, on our vessels. Um, we are applying uh, low friction paint on all our vessels. Um, we're looking at uh, installing echo torque to reduce the fluctuations in engine power and lead to savings. Uh, and um, and we have we also uh, have tested biofuels on our vessels on our, on our LR1s, which are all now certified to to burn biofuels. Uh, the test went uh, with a B30 blend went very well, um, and we are now planning to test also B40 and B50 blends on our vessels. Thank you, Carlos. So that concludes our discussion. Uh, thank you for being with us. We had the opportunity to discuss about the product tanker market and the micro international shipping with Carlos Balesta di Motola, who is the chief financial officer of the company. So thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, Nicola.